Hit Dong's Corner with Dexter and with John and with Mark. Check it out. He's got this a sweet hoodie on because he was shivering because it's cold today. Ah, uh, Hey, everybody. My name is John Bob. This is Comps Corner. This is Mark over here. That was Dexter, my dog. And we are reading Harry Potter every single day for an hour to, uh, to explore the mysterious, wonderful world of wizarding. Uh, wizarding. Uh, I have never read Harry Potter before. It's my first time. So please don't spoil it in the chats. Uh, if you do, fie upon your head. Fie, may the skies fall and crush your head and skull to pieces. A pox. A pox upon your soul. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't read it before. I've only seen two of the movies. As a teenager, don't remember anything from them except for the hall, the hallway with the, with the lights and some of the owls. That's all I remember from them. Uh, and that's pretty much it. You know, we, me, and, me and Mark were talking about some of the... if. If characters could have a motto, just like the thing that encapsulates them completely, for Hermione, you'd be, I don't think that's a good idea, Harry. Uh, for for Ron, that'd be, oh, I'm surprised by that. <laughs> and uh, Harry would, Harry's, Harry's would be, at least for this book, would be, I'm feeling really crappy and it's everybody else's fault. Uh, yeah, th those are a couple of, we're, we're going to figure out the rest of them as we go on. You, you, had, a, you had a good half-baked one for Dumbledore. Oh yeah, half-baked one for Dumbledore. One more time in the oven. Yeah, what was it again? It was, um, uh, oh yeah. I know everything, but I'm going to be infuriatingly mysterious. That's going to be his. Happy birthday. Whose happy birthday is this? Who's, whose birthday? Uh, who, one second. Somebody's saying it's the birthday. So, so happy to make it tonight. It's my birthday. Ragnild Wright. Usland, I hope I said your, na your, your name right. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to Ragn... Ragnhild! Sorry! Happy birthday to you! All right. Mark liked that one. That, that one made Mark laugh. Because you embarrassed yourself with that name try. <laughs> All right, friends, uh, let's get started here. Uh, I, I like this little tradition of putting on glasses and, and figuring out what I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to draw. I, I said it right. Okay, awesome, cool. Luna should be an awkward laugh. <laughs> okay, here we go. Drawing a scar. There we go. That's a good scar. Check it out. What? It's a good scar. I can hardly see it. Well, uh, only only those who have experienced death can. <laughs> okay. How do you know I haven't? Well, because you can't see the scar. <laughs> All right, friends. So, well, what what happened last time? Oh yeah. So uh, Harry and Cho kissed. Uh, they kissed. They uh, they are in love. Nice. nice. But. Uh, she is still in qualms about her and Cedric and her, do, feeling all the feelings that Hermione described because she is under, she understands. Not noise. Uh, not noise. Not noise. And also, Harry became a snake in his dream and and bit the crap out of Mr. Weasley. <laughs> He's like, even nice to me all the time. Ha! <laughs> That's what you get. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna get started on chapter twenty-two. Chapter 22, St. Mungus Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries. St. Mungus Hospital, oh, I, I wonder why they're gonna go there. Oh, because Mr. Weasley will, will be there. Probably some new characters, probably. My birthday just became the best one ever. As it should, as it should. Here we go. Harry was so relieved she was taking him seriously that this is McGonagall. Harry was so relieved she was taking him seriously that he did that he did not hesitate, but jumped out of bed at once, pulled on his dressing gown and pushed his glasses back onto his nose. Weasley, you ought, uh, you ought to come too," said Professor McGonagall. They followed Professor McGonagall past the silent figures of Neville, Dean, and Seamus, out of the dormitory, down the spiral stairs into the common room, through the portrait hole, and all along the fat lady's moonlit corridor. Harry felt as though the panic inside him might spill over at any moment. He wanted to run, to yell for Dumbledore. Mr. Weasley was bleeding. You know, let's put on this other tense music, how about that? Uh, Mr. Mr. Weasley was bleeding as they walked along so sedatedly. 
And what if those fangs? Harry tried to not to tried. Harry tried hard not to think my fangs had been poisonous. They passed Mrs. Norris, who turned her lamp-like eyes upon them and hissed faintly. But Professor McG <laughs> but Professor McGonagall said, "Shoo!" Mrs. Norris slunk away into the shadows, and in a few minutes they had reached the sto the stone gargoyle guarding the entrance to Dumbledore's office. Fizzing Wisby, said Professor McGonagall. I love that password. That's an awesome password. <laughs> the gargoyle sprang to life and leapt aside. The wall behind it splits in two to reveal a stone staircase that was moving continually upwards like a spiral escalator. The three of them stepped onto the moving staircase. The wall closed behind them with a thud, and they were moving upwards in tight circles until they reached the highly polished oak door with the brass knocker shaped like a griffin. Oh, I just remembered something. Uh, there's going to be a fun... I'm going to re reveal something really fun next week. I think it's going to be ready for next week. I just wanted to put out... It just reminded me. It's a little spo uh, little, little teaser. It's going to be... It's, it's, it's really, really fun. People in the, in, the, in the community have created something that I'm going to use in every single video. And it's really, really cool. And I can't wait to show you. It's going to happen sometime next week. Yeah, sorry. I just got excited by, by that for some reason. Though it was now well past midnight, there were voices coming from inside the room. A positive babble of them. Oh, it's going to be a lot of voices. It sounded as, as though Dumbledore was entertaining at least a dozen people. Woo-wee! Hello, Barbara. Professor McGonagall rapped three times with the griffin knocker, and the voices ceased abruptly, as though someone had switched them all off. The door opened of its own accord, and Professor McGonagall led Harry and Ron inside. The room was in half darkness. Okay, let's see if I can change the lighting here. Uh, I'll, do, I'll make that happen. The strange silver instruments standing on tables were silent, and still rather than, st and still, rather than whirring, and emoting puffs of smoke as they usually did. The portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses covering the walls were all snoozing in their frames. Behind the door, a, mag a, a magnificent red and gold bird the size of a swan dozed on its perch with its head under its wing. Oh, oh no, who's saying this? Oh, yeah. oh it's you, Professor Mc McGonagall. And, ah. Oh. Dumbledore was sitting in a high-backed chair be behind his desk. We finally get to... We're going to hear something from Dumbledore, hopefully. I want something to happen. Ah, so cool how you teased us. Ah, <laughs> Nathan, yeah, teased you. <laughs> For some reason, I'm not holding out hope that he's going to say it. You, you don't think that uh, Dumbledore will say anything, eh? I don't eh? know. I don't know. I just feel like he's been so secretive. And mm -hmm. we haven't heard anything from him. I'm not expecting it. Because hmm. I don't want to be disappointed. Oh, right. Just don't step out. Don't risk in order not to, to not get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Experience too much hurt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, Mark. <laughs> uh, 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 Dumbledore was sitting in a high-backed chair behind his desk. He leaned forward into the pool of candlelight, illuminating the papers laid out before him. He was wearing a magnificently embroidered purple and gold dressing gown over a snowy white nightshirt. Damn! Bling, bling, bling. But seemed wide awake, his penetrating light blue eyes fixed intently upon Professor McGonagall. Professor Dumbledore, Potter has had a, well, a nightmare, said Professor McGonagall. He says it wasn't a nightmare, said Harry quickly. Professor Morgano looked around at Harry, frowning slightly. Very well then, Potter. You tell the headmaster about it. I... Well, I was asleep, said Harry, and even in his terror and his desperation to make Dumbledore understand, he felt slightly irritated that the headmaster was not looking at him, but examining his own interlocked fingers. But it wasn't an ordinary dream. It was real. I saw it happen. He took a deep breath. Ron's dad, Mr. Weasley, has been attacked by a giant snake. The words seemed to reverberate in the air after he had said them, sounding slightly ridiculous, even comic. 
There was a pause in which Dumbledore leaned back and stared meditatively at the ceiling. Ron looked from Harry to Dumbledore, white-faced and shocked. How did you see this? Dumbledore asked quietly, still not looking at Harry. What the heck? Well, I don't know, said Harry rather angrily. What did it matter? Inside my head, I suppose. You misunderstand me, said Dumbledore, still in the same calm tone. I mean, can you remember um, where you were positioned as you watched this attack happen? Were you perhaps standing beside the victim or else looking down on the scene from above? This was such a curious question that Harry gaped at Dumbledore. It was almost as though he knew. I was the snake, he said. I saw it all from the snake's point of view. Nobody else spoke for a moment. Then Dumbledore, now looking at Ron, who was still way-faced, asked in a new and a sharper voice, Is Arthur seriously injured? Yes, said Harry emphati emphatically. Why were they all so slow on the uptake? Did they not realize how much a person bled when fangs that long pierced their side? And why could Dumbledore not do him the courtesy of looking at him? But Dumbledore stood up so quickly it made Harry jump and addressed one of the old portraits hanging very near the ceiling. Everard, he said sharply, and you too, Dillis. A sallow-faced wizard with a short black fringe and an elderly witch with long silver ring ringlets in the frame beside him, both of whom seemed to have been in the deepest of sleeps, opened their eyes immediately. You were listening, said Dumbledore. The wizard nodded, sallow face with a short black fringe. Short black fringe? Something like that? The wizard nodded, the, uh, and the witch with long silver ringlets in the frame beside him. Okay. The wizard nodded. The witch said, Naturally. No. Naturally. The, the man has red hair and glasses, said Dumbledore. Everard, you will need to raise the alarm. Make sure he is found by the right people. Uh, what is going on? <laughs> I know, I know. Both nodded. I don't know. He's not looking at Harry. What is happening? I don't know, man. Why are the portrait people involved? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, both nodded and moved sideways out of their frames, but instead of emerging in neighboring pictures, as usually happen at Hogwarts, neither reappeared. One frame now contained nothing but a... But... <laughs> But, <laughs> but a burp. <laughs> Dumbledore has become very shy. That's why he won't look at Harry. <laughs> He's got a crush on Harry. Uh, that's funny. Um, one frame now contained nothing but a backdrop, backdrop of dark curtain. The other, a handsome leather armchair. Harry noticed that many of the other headmasters and mistresses on the wall, though snoring and drooling most convincingly, kept sneaking peeks at him from under their eyelids, and he suddenly understood who had been talking when they had knocked. This music still work? Still work for, for y'all? Everard and... Uh, is it Dumbledore? Yeah. Everard and Dillis were two of Hogwarts' most celebrated heads. Dumbledore said, now sweeping around Harry, Ron, and P Professor McGonagall to approach the magnificent sleeping bird on his perch b beside the door. Their renown is such that both have portraits hanging in other important wizarding institutions. As they are free to move between their own portraits, they can tell us what may be happening elsewhere. But Mr. Weasley could be anywhere, said Harry. Please sit down, all three of you said Dumbledore, as though Harry had not spoken. Everard and Dillis may not be back for several minutes. Professor McGonagall, if you could draw up extra chairs. The music works. Okay, great. Professor McGonagall pulled her wand from the pocket of her dressing gown and waved it. Three chairs appeared out of thin air, straight-backed and wooden, quite unlike the comfortable chintz armchairs that Dumbledore had conjured up at Harry's hearing. Harry sat down, watching Dumbledore over his shoulder. Dumbledore was now stroking Fox 
plumed golden head with one finger. The phoenix awoke immediately. He stretched his beautiful head high and observed Dumbledore through bright, dark eyes. We will need, Dumbledore said very quietly to the bird, a warning. There was a flash of fire and the phoenix had gone. We will need a warning? Okay, th obviously Harry seeing through Dumbledore's eyes, uh, at Voldemort's eyes or the snake's eyes and biting Mr. Weasley is something that has incited an event. It has yeah. incited something. Yeah. It has started something. Yeah. So he's reacting now. We need. We will need a warning. He, so the bird's going to go and warn the Order of the Phoenix, obviously, because it's a phoenix. That was a premonition, by the way. I didn't put the music on, but here you go. Here's a premonition. It's more like premagenius. Premagenius. But that is only because all the other ones are dirt shit. Um, funny, because every single one was true, and I landed every single one of them. But, you know, to each their own false judgment, you know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this bit for as long as humanly possible. What bit? What bit? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was a flash of fire and the phoenix whoosh, had gone. Dumbledore, Dumbledore now swooped down upon one of the fragile silver instruments whose function Harry had never known, carried it over to his desk, sat down facing them again, and tapped it gently with the tip of his wand. The instrument tinkled into life at once, at once with rhythmic clinking noises. Tiny puffs of pale green smoke issued from the minuscule silver a tube at the top. Dumbledore watched the smoke closely, his brow furrowed. After a few seconds, the tiny puffs became a steady stream of smoke that thickened and coiled in the air. A serpent's head grew out of the end of it, opening its mouth wide. Harry wondered whether the instrument was confirming his story. He looked eagerly at Dumbledore for a sign that he was right, but Dumbledore did not look up. Here we go, and here's a snake head. <laughs> Naturally, I'm a wizard. It all makes sense. <laughs> this is, these are his words. Naturally, naturally. <laughs> Naturally, naturally everything's natural. Everything's normal to him. Exactly. Nothing has ever surprised Dumbledore. <laughs> Nothing has ever surprised Dumbledore in the history of these books. It's That's like, so good. well, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you didn't see this coming. <laughs> uh, prim prima genius. Thank you, Lois. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, very good noise, 2440. I don't know what that means. Harry needs, needs a totem to spin. If it stays spinning, he is dreaming. If it topples over, he becomes a puking past. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Naturally, naturally. Murmured Dumbledore, 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 apparently to himself, still observing the stream of smoke without the slightest sign of surprise. But in essence, divided. Harry could make neither head nor tail of this question. I'm feeling you, Harry. The smoke serpent, however, split itself instantly into two snakes, <laughs> both coiling and undulating in the dark air. With a look of grim satisfaction, Dumbledore gave the instrument another gentle tap with his wand. The clinking noise, noise slowed and, uh, 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 sorry, I lost my place, slowed and died, and the smoke servants grew faint became a formless haze and vanish, vanished. Cool, cool, that makes, naturally. Dumbledore replaced the instrument on its spindly little table. Harry saw many of the old headmasters in the portraits follow him with their eyes. Then, realizing that Harry was watching them, hastily pretended to be sleeping again. Harry wanted to ask what the strange silver instrument was for, but before he could do so, there was a shout from the top of the wall to their right. The wizard uh, called 
Everard had reappeared in his portrait, panting slightly. With some whiskey. Back to this. Uh, oh, so this is Everard. Uh, Dumbledore! What news? Said Dumb uh, Dumbledore at once. I yelled until, a some, uh, until someone came running, said the wizard, who was mopping his brow on the curtain behind him. Said I'd heard someone, uh, said I'd heard something moving downstairs. They weren't sure whether to believe me, but went, but went down to check. You know there are no po portraits down there to watch from. Anyway, they carried him up a few minutes later. Oh, he doesn't look good. He's covered in blood. I ran along to uh, um, Elfrida Cragg's portrait to get a good view as I left. Good, said Dumbledore, as Rod made a convulsive movement. I take it Dillis will have seen him arrive then. And moments later, the silver ringlet, ringletted witch had reappeared in her picture too. She sank, coughing, into her armchair and said, Oh yes, they've taken him to St. Mungus, Dumbledore. They carried him past my portrait. Oh, you look bad. Thank you, said Dumbledore. He looked round at Professor McGonagall. Minerva, I need you to go and wake the other Weasley children. Of course. Professor McGonagall got, so he is injured. Shoot. Yeah. Okay, he so is really, injured. Harry is the best divination student out of them all. But it wasn't div It wasn't a divination. It wasn't a, pro a, a, pro a prophecy or a... It, it was yeah. him being yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Right? I see where you're coming from. But sometimes we're all wrong. <laughs> How many times have you been wrong today, John? Uh, today, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll admit, I've had one false premonition, but you know. Hmm. When? Hmm? Which one? What are you talking about? <laughs> you know when you were the most wrong today, John? When? When you got out of bed. Oh. <laughs> 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 wow. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, try. What, what a thrill that chase is for both of us, to be honest. Okay, well, let's get going. Boop! Um, okay, this is very serious, actually. Professor McGonagall got up and moved swiftly to the door. Harry cast a sideways glance at Ron, who was looking terrified. And Dumbledore, what about Molly? Molly who? said Professor McGonagall, pausing at the door. That will be a job for folks. Oh yeah, Molly, okay, right. That will be a job for folks when he has finished keeping a lookout for anybody approaching, said Dumbledore. But she may already know that excellent clock of hers. Harry knew Dumbledore was referring to the clock that told, uh, not the time, but the whereabouts, all right, the whereabouts and conditions of the various Weasley family members. And with a pang, he thought that Mr. Weasley's hand must, even now, be pointing at mortal peril. But it was very late. Mrs. Weasley was probably asleep, not watching the clock. Harry felt cold as he remembered Mrs. Weasley, and Mrs. Weasley's boggart turning into, into Mr. Weasley's lifeless body. Oh, her poor heart. His glasses askew, blood running down his face. But Mr. Weasley wasn't going to die. He couldn't. It's getting serious up in here, totally. Yeah. Um, Dumbledore was now rummaging in a cupboard behind Harry and Ron. He emerged from it carrying a blackened old kettle, which, which he placed carefully on his desk. He raised his wand and murmured, Portis, Portis, Portis. For a moment, the kettle trembled, glowing with an odd blue light. Then it quivered to rest as solidly black as ever. <sighs> <laughs> what is he doing? He's... <laughs> Dumbledore marched over to another portrait, this time of a clever-looking wizard with a pointed beard, who had been painted wearing the Slytherin colors of green and silver, and was ap apparently sleeping so deeply that he could not hear Dumbledore's voice when he attempted to rouse him. Phineas! Phineas! The subjects of the portraits lining the room were no longer pretending to be asleep. They were shifting around in their frames, the better to watch what was happening. Uh, is Phineas... Is Phineas uh, Sirius Black's father or ancestor? 
I feel like I've heard the word the name Phineas before. I don't, I don't know. Okay, don't reveal it. Uh, we'll find out now. Don't, don't, don't write anything in the chat, please. Uh, the sub, uh, when the clever-looking wizard continued to feign sleep, some of them shouted his name too. Phineas. No. Phineas. 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 He could not pretend any longer. He gave a theatrical jerk and spread his eyes open wide. If he's a, oh gosh, this music, it, uh, it's gonna replay it. Uh, if, maybe if he's a main character, give me some adjectives. If not, I'm just gonna give him one now and we'll just move on. But if he is somebody who pops up more often, give me some adjectives for him. And according to the book, not the movies, according to the book, he gave a theatrical jerk and opened his eyes open wide. Oh, did someone call? Was that American? <laughs> yeah. I need you to visit your other portrait again, Phineas, said Dumbledore. I've got another message. Visit my other portrait, said Phineas in a reedy. What's reedy? What does reedy mean? Reedy voice. Reedy. Like, like book smart? Like, like reads a lot? <laughs> <laughs> Bit smarmy, snide, superior. Okay, cool. Have to make him different than Percy and Malfoy. It's smart, old wise dude, nothing else. Old and smarmy and snide. Old and smarmy and snide. Yeah, 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 there we go. Yeah, snobbish. Nasally. Visit now the portrait, said Phineas in a reedy voice, giving a long fake yawn, his eyes traveling around the room, focusing on Harry. Oh no, Dumbledore, I'm too tired tonight. Something about Phineas's voice was familiar to Harry. Where had he heard it before? But before he could think, the portraits on the surrounding walls broke into a storm of protest. Um, a corpulent, red-nosed wizard brandishing his fist. It's some abomination, sir! Wrote <laughs> a corpulent, red-nosed wizard brandishing his fists. Dereliction of duty! What? <laughs> it's just some guy who's angry at him. <laughs> a frail looking old wizard whom Harry recognized as Dumbledore's predecessor. Okay. We are, we are not bound to give service to the present headmaster of Hogwarts, cried a frail looking old wizard whom Harry recognized as Dumbledore's predecessor, Armando Dippet. Shame on you, Phineas! Gimlet eyed witch. Okay. Shall I persuade him, Dumbledore? <laughs> called a gimlet-eyed witch, raising an unusually thick wand that looked not unlike a birch rod. Perfect, you sound like my grandpa. Ha <laughs> ha! Great. Old, white, sneaking, kind of racist against mudbloods. <laughs> well, I think you already told me something again, HRDR. You told me something that hasn't happened yet, okay? Now, now I know that's racist against mudbloods, okay. Um... Uh, oh. oh, very well, said the wizard called Phineas, eyeing the wand with mild apprehension. Though he may well have destroyed my picture by now, he's done away with most of the family. Uh, Sirius knows not to destroy your portrait. Yeah, that's what I thought, said Dumbledore. And Harry realized immediately where he had heard Phineas's voice before, issuing from the apparently empty frame in his bedroom in Grimmauld Place. You are to give him the message that Arthur Weasley has been gravely injured, and that his wife, children, and Harry Potter will be arriving at his house shortly. Do you understand? Arthur Weasley, injured. Wife and children and Harry Potter are coming to stay, repeated Phineas in a bored voice. Yes, yes, very well. He sloped away into the frame of the portrait and disappeared from view at the very moment the study door opened again. Fred, George, and Ginny were ushered inside by Professor McGonagall, all three of them looking disheveled and shocked, still in their night things. It's like an episode of Monty Python. Huh? <laughs> um, Harry, what's going on? Asked Ginny, who looked frightened. Professor McGonagall says you saw Dad get hurt. Your father has been injured in the course of his work for the Order of the Phoenix, said Dumbledore, before Harry could speak. He has been taken to St. 
Mungus Hospital for ma magical maladies and injuries. I am sending you back to Sirius's house, which is much more convenient for the hospital than the burrow. You will meet your mother there. How are we going? asked Fred, looking shaken. Flu powder? No, said Dumbledore. Flu powder is not safe at the moment. The network is being watched. You will be taken... A, you will be taking a port key. He, no, he indicated the old kettle. Oh, it's a port key. He indicated the old kettle lying innocently on his desk. We are just waiting for Phineas Nigellus uh, to report back. I want to be sure that the coast is clear before sending you. There was a flash of flame in the very middle of the office, leaving behind a single golden feather that floated gently to the floor. It is Fawkes warning, said Dumbledore, catching the feather as it fell. Professor Umbridge must know you are out of your beds. Minerva, go and head her off. Tell her any story. Professor McGonagall was gone in a swish of tartan. Uh, is that, is that a be delighted, said a bored voice behind Dumbledore. The wizard called Phineas had reappeared in front of his Slytherin banner. My great-great-grandson has always had an odd taste in house guests. Come here, then. No, no, come here, then, Dumbledore said to Harry and the Weasleys. And, and quickly, before anyone else joins us. Harry and the others gathered around Dumbledore's desk. <clears throat> Come here. Uh, oh, sorry. You have all used a port key before, asked Dumbledore, and they nodded, each reaching out to touch some part of the blackened kettle. Good. On the count of three, then. One. Two. It happened in a fraction of a second. In the infinitesimal, inf infinitesimal, oh, infi infin infinitesimal, infinitesimal? Infinitesimal. Okay. Infinitesimal. Oh. It's a hard word to say. Pause before Dumbledore said, Three! Harry looked up at him. They were very close together, and Dumbledore's clear glue, blue gaze moved from the port key to Harry's face. At once, Harry's scar burned white hot, as though the old wound had burst open again, and unbidden, unwanted, but terrifyingly strong, there rose within Harry a hatred so powerful he felt for that instant, he would like nothing better than to strike, to bite, to sink his fangs into the man before him. Three! Harry felt a powerful jerk behind his navel. The ground vanished from beneath his feet. His hand was glued to the, to the kettle. He was banging into the others as they all sped forwards in a swirl of colors and a rush of wind, the, cur the kettle pulling them onwards until his feet hit the ground so hard his knees buckled, the kettle cluttered to the ground, and somewhere close at hand, a voice said, who's saying this? I don't know. Back again, the blood traitor brats. Is it true their father's dying? Out, roared a second voice. Okay. Um, so this can't really be a premonition. Well, I got a premonition part of this, but okay. Here's genius. It's time for John genius Um So obviously, Harry and Voldemort are very, very closely linked together. Obviously. Um, I think as Harry grows with power, Voldemort grows with power. They both grow in power equally. They are the yin and yang of whatever power they are both in control of or linked with. And uh, since I, it, Harry feels what Voldemort feels very often, right? Or when 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 Voldemort's angry, his scar hurts, right? I think the same thing's happening on Voldemort's side. He's feeling whatever maybe positive feelings or angry feelings that Harry is feeling as well. Voldemort is feeling the same things. They are intri intrinsically linked. I don't know how yet. Um, and so the reason Dumbledore is not looking at him or not interacting with him is both because he realizes the, the strong, strong hatred or Voldemort, uh, Voldemort knows that Dumbledore is immensely powerful and hates him so much that, that at this point with Harry growing so strong, he will feel the same kind of hatred or 
the need to attack Voldemort that uh, uh, Dumbledore that Voldemort would feel. So Dumbledore has been protecting him the whole time from those strong feelings of hate. Does that make sense to you? Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Mm. <laughs> uh, and they yeah, kissed. I, 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 I felt similar. I feel yeah. like I was kind of on the same track. I didn't really like go into the whole like Harry Voldemort being connected thing, but I was definitely like, okay, that's definitely some reasoning why Dumbledore has had no interaction with Harry and not even looking at him because he probably suspects that there's going to be that, that yeah. part there. Yeah. I just don't necessarily know why. Yeah. So maybe maybe I'm thinking as the the last two books go on, and this one concludes the last two books go on, they're going to be, you know, growing, growing, growing in power, both of them equally, equally strong in power, and then they'll have to confront each other, and I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Harry will have to sacrifice himself to, to kill Voldemort. Um... Um, yeah, that's all I can think of right now. No doubt, we got a, we got so much book in front of us of this and the other books. We yeah, got well, so much. We only passed the halfway book as part of the whole series in this book. Yeah, which is so crazy. Yeah. So crazy. That's wild. All right. Dumbledore isn't looking for Harry because he's protecting him from strong feelings of hate. Thank you for your transcription of that garbage, Lois. That's <laughs> what Nathan wrote. <laughs> <laughs> because Voldemort is secretly Harry's father. <laughs> here at Star Wars, here we come. Okay, uh, let's keep going. This is this is great. This is really great. Harry scrambled to his feet and looked around. They had arrived in the gloomy basin kitchen. I'm gonna make this maybe a bit green. Maybe. I don't know. Do, do I like this? I don't know. If you like it, let me know. If not, let's move. Let's find something else. Harry scrambled to his feet and looked around. They had arrived in the gloomy basement kitchen of Number Twelve, Grimmauld Place. The only sources of light were the fire and one guttering candle, which illuminated the remains of a solitary supper. Creature, oh yeah, creature, creature, creature was disappearing through the door to the hall, looking back at the malevolent, malevolently. There we go. Through the door to the hall, he's just like. <laughs> As he hitched up his loincloth, <laughs> Sirius was hurrying towards them all, looking anxious. He was unshaven and still in his day clothes. There were also a slightly mundungus like whiff of stale drink about him. What's going on? He said, stretching out a hand to help Ginny up. Phineas Nagellus said Arthur's been badly, badly injured. Ask Harry. Yeah, I want to hear this for myself, said George. The twins and Ginny were staring at him. Creature's footsteps had stopped on the stairs outside. It was, Harry began. This was even worse than telling McGonagall and Dumbledore. I had a, a kind of vision. And he told them all that he had seen. Though he altered the story so that it sounded as though he had watched from the sidelines as the snake attacked, rather rather than from behind the snake's own eyes. Oh. Ron, who was still very white, gave him a fleeting look, but he did not speak. When Harry had finished, Fred, George, and Ginny continued to stare at him for a moment. Harry did not know whether he was imagining it or not, but he fancied there was something accusatory in their looks. Well, if they were going to blame him just for seeing the attack, he was glad he had not told them that he had been inside the snake all this time. No, 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 it's okay. Uh, you, what, what, you, what, you can, what you can uh, transcribe is that I think they are feeling what the other person's feeling, also Dumbledore, and that they will, and that Harry will have to sacrifice himself at the end of this to kill uh, Voldemort. I'm calling it this early. I'm calling it this early. Nobody comment on it. Just Lois is gonna, she's gonna um, record it. Thank you, Lois. Uh, is Mum here? Said Fred, turning to Sirius. She probably doesn't even know what's happened yet. Said Sirius. The important thing was to get you away before Umbridge could interfere. I expect Dumbledore's letting Molly know now. Uh, 
we've got to go to get, we've got to go to St. Mungus, said Ginny urgently. She looked around at her brothers. They were, of course, still in their pajamas. Sirius, can you lend us cloaks or anything? Hang on, you can't go tearing off to St. Mungus. Mungus, said Sirius. Of course we can go to St. Mungus if we want, said Fred, with a mulish expression. He's our dad. And how are you going to explain how you knew Arthur was attacked before the hospital even let his wife know? What does it matter? said George hotly. It matters because we don't want to draw attention to the fact that Harry is having visions of things that are happening hundreds of miles away, said Sirius angrily. Have you any idea what the Ministry would make of that information? Fred and George looked as though they could not care less what the Ministry made of anything. Ron was still ashen-faced and silent. Ginny said, Somebody else could have told us. We could have heard it somewhere other than Harry. Like who? said Sirius impatiently. Listen, your dad's been hurt while on duty for the Order, and the circumstances are fishy enough without his children knowing about it seconds after it happened. You could seriously damage the Order's we don't care about the dumb order, shouted Fred. It's our dad dying we're talking about, yelled George. Your father knew what, what he was getting into, and he won't thank you for messing things up for the order, said Sirius, equally angry. This is how it is. This is why you're not in the order. You don't understand. There are things worth dying for. Easy for you to say, stuck here. He bellowed Fred. I don't see you risking your neck. The little color remaining in Sirius's face drained from it. He looked for a moment as though he would quite like to hit Fred. But when he spoke, it was in a voice of determined calm. I know it's hard, but we've all got to act as though we don't know anything yet. We've got to stay put. At, le at least until we hear from your mother. All right? Fred and George still looked mutinous. Ginny, however, took a few steps over to the nearest chair and sank into it. Harry looked at Ron, who made a funny movement somewhere between a nod and a shrug, and they sat down too. The twins glared at Sirius for another minute, then took seats either side of Ginny. Oh, man, that was intense. Yeah. That's right, said Sirius encouragingly. Come on, let's all, let's all have a drink while we're waiting. At your butterbeer. He raised his wand as he spoke, and half a dozen bottles came flying towards them out of the pantry, skidded along the table, scattering the debris of Sirius's meal, and stopped neatly in front of the six of them. They all drank. And for a while, the only sounds were those of the crackling of the kitchen fire and the soft thud of their bottles on the table. Harry was only drinking to have something to do with his hands. His stomach was full of horrible, hot, bubbling guilt. They would not be here if it, they would not be here if it, if it were not for him. They would all still be asleep in bed. And it was no good telling himself that by raising the alarm, he'd ensured that Mr. Weasley was found because there was also the inescapable business of it being he who had attacked Mr. Weasley in the first place. Don't be stupid. You haven't got fangs, he told himself, trying to keep calm, though the hand on his butter beer bottle was shaking. You were lying in bed. You weren't attacking anyone. But then, what just happened in Dumbledore's, Dumbledore's office? He asked himself. I felt like I, I wanted to attack Dumbledore, too. He put the bottle down a little harder than he meant to, and it slopped over on the table. No one took any notice. Then a burst of fire in midair illuminated the dirty plates in front of them, and as they gave cries of shock, a scroll of parchment fell with a thud onto the table, accompanied by a single golden phoenix tail feather. Fox, said Sirius at once, snatching up the parchment. That's not Dumbledore's writing. Oh, it must be a message from your mother. Here. Yeah. He thrust the letter into George's hand, who ripped it open and read aloud. Dad is still alive. I'm setting out for St. Mungus's now. Stay where you are. I will send news as soon as I can. Mum. 
George looked around the table. Still alive, he said slowly. But that makes it sound... He did not need to finish the sentence. It sounded to Harry, too, as though Mr. Weasley was hovering somewhere between life and death. Ugh. Still exceptionally pale, Ron stared at the back of his mother's letter, as though it might speak words of comfort to him. Fred pulled the parchment out of George's hands and read it for himself, then looked up at Harry, who felt his hand shaking on his but butterbeer bottle again and clenched it more tightly to stop the trembling. Oh man, just imagine like the feeling of guilt you would feel in this. I, if, if I was like, somehow like, I did something, maybe, maybe not, and my best buddy's dad is the result of that, I would be, like, dying. It's not just your best buddy's dad. Like, that guy's been... Your dad. dad to you, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah ugh. Look at you, rough. Yeah. Yeah, really, I feel like Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. If Harry had ever sat through a longer night than this one, he could not remember it. It's so around the 20 minute mark where this song gets super intense. <laughs> the first, oh, oh, hey, hey there, Mark. <laughs> Poor Harry, he can't get a rest, Carla. Yeah, that's right. It's very, very true. Harry's ha having, uh, G Chicago says, Harry's having a hard time this year. This is the, yeah, this is the book where it's been the hardest on Harry. Well, I don't know. The, la the, the end of the last book was pretty rough too, but just this is more a consistent hardness on him. If Harry had ever sat through a longer night than this one, he could not remember it. Sirius suggested once, without any real conviction, that they all go to bed, but the Weasleys' looks of disgust were answer enough. They mostly sat in silence around the table, watching the candle wink, wick, wick, sinking lower and lower into liquid wax, occasionally raising a bottle to their lips, speaking only to check the time, to wonder aloud what was happening, and to reassure each other that if there were bad news, they would know straight away, for Mrs. Weasley was, must long since have arrived at St. Saint, Saint Mungus. <laughs> Fred fell into a doze, his head lolling sideways onto his shoulder. Ginny was curled like a cat on her chair, but her eyes were open. Harry could see the... <laughs> this is just kind of funny. Just curled. Going like... <laughs> Seems like you've already forgotten when you killed my dad by throwing him into a silo during harvest time on the farm. That's... I mean, that's a very funny... I mean, not... It's a funny scenario as a joke, but... Uh, it's out of left field, Nathan. It's out of left field. You can do better. <laughs> a little contrived. Yeah, a little, little contrived. Fred fell into a doze. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ron was sitting with his head in his hands. Whether awake or asleep, it, it was impossible to tell. Harry and Sirius looked at each other every so often, intruders upon the family grief, waiting, waiting. At ten past five in the morning, by Ron's watch, the kitchen doors the kitchen door swung open, and Mrs. Weasley entered the kitchen. She was extremely pale, but when they all turned to look at her, Fred, Ron, and Harry half rising from the chairs, she gave a wan smile. He's going to be all right, she said, her voice weak with tiredness. He's sleeping. We can all go and see him later. Bill's sitting with him now. He's going to take the morning off work. Oh, poor Mrs. Weasley. I feel so much for Mrs. Weasley. Oh, oh man. Fred, be Fred fell back into his chair with his hands over his face. George and Ginny got up, walked swiftly over to their mother, and hugged her. I'm going to change the, the music back now. Oh, and that, that too, I guess. There we go. Um... George and Ginny got up, walked swiftly over to their mother and hugged her. Ron gave a very shaky laugh and downed the rest of his butterbeer in one gulp. Breakfast, said Sirius loudly and joyfully, jumping to his feet. Where's that accursed house elf? Creature! Creature! But Creature did not answer the summons. Uh, are you saying Mungus because it's wrong on purpose? Mungus? Oh, how do you pronounce it then? I thought it was Mungus. Mungos? 
Is it Mungo's? It's longer because it's Friday. I, I hope you go a little longer today. Um, maybe. I'm meeting some friends. So, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Don't worry, everyone. He promised to go later today. Let, how, how, how much longer is this chapter? It's quite a while. Oh, I think I can finish this chapter, maybe. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how we're doing with time, okay? Not promising anything! Oh, forget it then, muttered Sirius, counting the people in front of him. So, it's breakfast for... Let's see, uh, seven bacon and eggs, I think, and some tea and toast. Harry hurried over to the stove to help. He did not want to intrude on the Weasley's happiness, and he dreaded the moment when Mrs. Weasley would ask him to recount his vision. However, he had barely taken plates from the dresser when Mrs. Weasley lifted them out of his hands and pulled him into a hug. How sweet is she? How sweet is she? Mungo's. Mungo's. Okay, gotcha. Mango, <laughs> Natasha. Mangoes! I don't know what would have happened if it hadn't been for you, Harry, she said in a muffled voice. They might not have found Arthur for hours, and then it would have been too late. But thanks to you, he's alive. And Dumbledore's been able to think up a good cover story for Arthur. Being where he was, you've no idea what trouble he would have been otherwise. Oh, look at poor Sturgis. Harry could hardly bear her gratitude. But fortunately, she soon released him to turn to Sirius and thank him for looking after her children through the night. Sirius said he was very pleased to have been able to help and hoped they would all stay with him as long as Mrs. Mr. Weasley was in hospital. Oh, Sirius, I, I, I'm so grateful. They think they'll, they think he'll be there a little. They think he'll be there a little while, and it would be a wonderful to be nearer. Of course, that might mean we're here for Christmas. The more the merrier, said Sirius with such obvious sincerity that, oh, that Mrs. Weasley beamed at him, threw on an apron and began to help him with breakfast. Sirius, Harry muttered, unable to stand it a moment longer. Can I have a quick word? Uh, now. He walked into the dark pantry and Sirius followed. Without preamble, Harry told his godfather every detail of the vision he had, he had had including the fact that he himself had been the snake who had attacked Mr. Weasley. When he paused for breath, Sirius said, Did you tell Dumbledore this? Yes, said Harry impatiently, but he didn't tell me what it meant. Well, he doesn't tell me anything anymore now. I'm sure he would have told you if it was anything to worry about, said Sirius steadily. But that's not all, said Harry, in a voice only a little above a whisper. Sirius, I... I think I'm going mad. Back in Dumbledore's office, just before we, we took the port key, for a couple of seconds there, I thought I was a snake. I felt like one. My scar really hurt when I was looking at Dumbledore. Serious, I wanted to attack him. You could only see a sliver of Sirius's face. The rest was in darkness. It must have... It must have been the aftermath of the vision. That's all, said Sirius. You are still thinking of the dream, or whatever it was, and... It wasn't that, said Harry, shaking his head. It was like something rose up inside me, like there's a snake inside me. You need to sleep, said Sirius firmly. You're going to have breakfast and go upstairs to bed, and after lunch, you can go and see Arthur with the others. You're in shock, Harry. You're blaming yourself for something you only witnessed, and it's lucky you did witness it, or Arthur might have died. Just stop worrying. He clapped Harry on the shoulder and left the pantry, leaving Harry standing alone in the dark. Oh yeah, Mark had to go. Mar Mar Mark's gone. He had to go very close to seven, so he's out of here. Oh, wowza. I'm gonna keep going for a little bit, okay? Everyone but Harry spent the rest of the morning sleeping. He went up to the bedroom. He actually, uh, here's a question. I, I know I haven't done the like the whole questions in the middle thing for a while. I do actually enjoy those. I, I enjoy reading reading your responses. Um, that's because I've just been distracted with a lot of different things of trying to figure things out. You know, a lot of stuff coming, especially last week. Tease, tease, tease. Nathan, tease, tease, tease. Um, but who is a relative of yours? Whether it's a grandpa, cousin niece, nephew, uncle, or aunt, who has meant the most to you 
who has impacted your life the most? I would like to know that. Harry's first kiss and Arthur's attack happened within 12 hours of each other. Yeah. Everyone but Harry spent the rest of the morning sleeping. He went up to the bedroom he and Ron had shared over the last few weeks of summer. But while Ron crawled into bed and was asleep within minutes, Harry sat fully clothed, hunched against the cold metal bars of the bedstead, keeping, keeping himself deliberately uncomfortable, determined not to fall asleep into a doze, terrified that he might become the serpent again in his sleep. Oh gosh, that's the worst. Oh, that'd be the worst, being scared to fall asleep because something might happen in your sleep. Ugh. And wait to find that he had attacked Ron or else slithered through the house after one of the others. When Ron woke up, Harry pretended to have enjoyed a f refreshing nap too. <laughs> oh, oh gosh, that was nice. <laughs> Their trunks arrived from Hogwarts while they were eating lunch, so they could dress as muggles for the trip to St. Mungo's. Everybody except Harry was riotously happy and talkative as they changed out of their robes into jeans and sweatshirts. When Tonks and Mad-Eye turned up to escort them across London, they greeted them gleefully, laughing at the bowler hat Mad-Eye was wearing at an angle to conceal his magical eye, <laughs> and assuring him truthfully that Tonks, whose hair was short and bright pink again, would attract far less attention on the underground. My grandpa, aka Nana, she lived with us and taught me how to sew. And you you sew a lot, Carrie. You, Carrie has been sewing, I mean, Carrie, I know you, maybe you don't want to brag or anything, but just let me know, let us know. How many masks have you sewed for people during this time? I would love to know that, Carrie. Uh, my sister's the only real family I had, Shailen. Yeah, I think you, I, I remember you telling us uh, about her. Anything to do with his mouth? <laughs> one of my nieces is like a little sister to me, but my relationship with him is the best. That's awesome, Janessa. My older cousin likes my sister more than my cousin, and she, <laughs> that's great. She likes my guy post of good life. My aunt, she's like the mom I wish I had. She's my buddy. Oh, that's good to have this kind of family. Maybe my mom? My cousin like my older sister. Okay, I'm not gonna read through all these. I'm gonna read these later, but thank you. These, these are great. I, lo I love reading these. I should ask these questions more often. Tonks was very interested in Harry's vision of the attack on Mr. Weasley, something Harry was not remotely interested in discussing. There isn't any seer blood in your family, is there? She inquired curiously, as they sat side by side on a train rattling towards the heart of the city. No, said Harry, thinking of Professor Trelawney and feeling insulted. Because <laughs> that's his only experience of seer, right? I don't think he knows anybody else who's a seer. No, said Tonks musingly. No. I suppose it's not really prophecy you're doing, is it? I mean, you're not seeing the future, you're seeing the present. It's odd, isn't it? Well, useful though. She's thinking just like Mark was thinking before. She's thinking the exact same thing that Mark was thinking. Mark is Tonks, Tonks is Mark. Mark's T uh, Tark, Tark. Harry didn't answer. Fortunately, they got out at the next stop, a station in the very heart of London. And, and in the bustle of leaving the train, he was able to, uh, to allow Fred and George to get between himself and Tonks, who was leading the way. They all followed her up the escalator, moody clunking. Oh, Dex is up. <laughs> um, they all followed her up the escalator, moody clunking along at the back of the group, his bowler tilted low and one gnarled hand stuck in between the buttons of his coat, clutching his wand. Harry thought he sensed the concealed eye staring hard at him. Trying to avoid any more questions about his dream, he asked Mad-Eye where St. Mungo's was hidden. Tonks is you, Mark is Harry. <laughs> Mork, yeah, true. Not far from here, grunted Mo Moody, as they stood out in, into the wintry air on, on a broad store-lined street packed with Christmas shoppers. He pushed Harry a little ahead of him and stumped along just behind. Harry knew the eye was rolling in all directions under the tilted hat. Is this him speaking? Oh, yeah. no, uh, uh, beautiful, lovely Scotland. There we go. There, there we go. There we go. Yeah, there, there. Wasn't easy to find a good location for a hospital. Nowhere in Diagon Alley was big enough and we couldn't have it on the ground like the Ministry. Wouldn't be healthy. In the end, they managed to get a hold of a building up here. Theory was, sick wizards could come and go and just blend in with the crowd. 
He seized Harry's shoulder to prevent them from being separated by a gaggle of shoppers, plainly intent on nothing but making it into a nearby shop full of electrical gadgets. Here we go, said Mo Moody a mo moment later. Sorry. Oh, I, need it. I need some water. I, I need I need uh, to moisten my mouth with some water. They had arrived outside a large, old-fashioned, red-brick apartment store called Purge and Dow's Limited. The place had a shabby, miserable air. The window displays... Oh, there he goes. There he goes. Making, making it more comfortable for himself somehow. <laughs> the place had a shabby, miserable air. The window displays consisted of a few chipped dummies with their wigs askew, standing at random and modeling fashions at least ten years out of date. Large signs on all the dusty doors read, Closed for re refurbishment. Harry distinctly heard a large woman laden with plastic shopping bags say to her friends as they passed, It's never open, that place. Right, said P Tonks, beckoning them towards a window displaying nothing but a particularly ugly female dummy. Its false eyelashes were hanging off and it was modeling a green nylon pinafore. Pinafore dress. Everybody ready? They nodded, clustering around her. Mo Moody gave Harry another shove between the shoulder blades to urge him forward, and Tonks leaned close to the glass, looking up at the very ugly dummy, her breath steaming up the glass. Watcha, she said. We're here to see Arthur Weasley. Harry thought how absurd it was for Tonks to expect the dummy to hear, her talking so quietly through a sheet of glass with buses rumbling along behind her and all the racket of a street full of shoppers. Then he reminded himself that dummies couldn't hear anyway. Next second, his mouth opened in shock as the dummy gave a tiny nod and beckoned with his jointed finger and Tonks had seized Ginny and Mrs. Weasley by the elbows, stepped right through the glass and vanished. Uh, yeah, this is gonna go on for a while, sorry. I'm gonna end here, this is a good point to end. As soon as they enter St. Mungo's. I'm gonna end here. I'm sorry, but this is free entertainment. <laughs> uh, what are you writing here? Uh, let's hang out a little bit. Let, let's hang out a little bit, everybody. You wanna hang out? Um, is is Dex licking the camera again or licking John's toes? No, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bowl of water here that he, that he licks every once in a while. Oh yeah, what, what, did, what did Carrie write? Did you write how many you how many you made, Carrie? I don't think you did. I'm about a th one thousand three hundred. Okay, first of all, it's seven o'clock. Hey, yo, healthcare workers! Thank you for making our lives better. That's the best song I've ever made up. And uh, Carrie, you're killing it. One thousand three hundred. Thank you so much. That is incredible. Holy smokes. Holy smokes, that's so much. Wow. Oh, man. Uh, my abuelita, grandma before she would die, was really sick, and I had plenty of times watching her beside her bed. Many times I kept the, the night reading those books, so beautiful memories and a lot of talks. Uh, oh, you were reading these books while being with her. Oh, that's so nice, Barbara. Is it, I'm seeing it, because I see a little accent above your A name, is it ba Barbara, or Bar, I don't know, I don't, is it, does it make it sound different? I don't really know. Um, but that's really lovely. I love that, that's really lovely. It's great bringing him to a party, people think it's very magnanimous for actually hanging it with someone like John. Oh, Nathan's at it again with uh, excellent jokes. <laughs> Natasha, I've got a 4th of July barbecue to go to, bye y'all, love from a town. Thank you, see you later, have fun at the barbecue. 1,300, that's incredible. It's a pleasure for, for, thanks for putting me in touch with Jill. Holy moly, that's awesome, Carrie. Happy to help. Whew, that was a, that was a cool, th th this is a cool portion we, re we read today. I, I think I'm getting a clear picture of me what's happening with Harry and Dumbledore and Voldemort. Maybe, but who knows. Rowling's really good at throwing red herrings and diverting theories. I mean, all of mine have been right, but I just like from what I've read about previous theories, I've read a lot about previous theories, what people thought might have happened in the first couple of books. 
Um, a lot of them were wrong. A lot of them were wrong. Mine were always right. But she was so good at diverting other people. Yeah. Yeah. Alana, my, my mama. She was in and out of rehab and jail when I was younger, ages 8 to 18. But she's done a lot of difficult work, and we've mended our relationship, and now she's everything to me. That is awesome. I love that, Alana. I really love that. That's so cool. I love reconciliation. I love understanding people on a time, not on a timeline, in, in life. People change. Um, I'm feeling nowadays a lot is judging people and saying, this is who you are forever. You know, that's what's happening nowadays. And that, it's actually been difficult to witness. So stories like that, I'm like, oh, I love that so much. Were you expecting someone to be put in the hospital this book? No, I was not. I was not Chicago. Ch Ch Chicago 9. Jenny Cope, my three siblings are all at least 10 years older than me, so they kind of raised me to have all have three. All three have influenced me in so many ways. Jenny Cope. That's cool. I've had, I have one older brother, Michael. A great older brother. Always wondered how it is to have multiple siblings. Bruno Mil Milo, do you always make your bed, or is it just for us? <laughs> Honestly, it's just for you. <laughs> but it's also because when I was testing things out, I was like, oh, the colors of this bed sheet work really well with everything. You know? And so I was like, oh, it just adds to the to the scene. So <laughs> that's the truth. These are all such wonderful family stories. They really are, Nevneet. Alex, Alex Robbie. I've been here the whole stream, but I don't think I've said a single thing. Well, thanks for saying the single thing there. Thanks for tuning in, Alex. Appreciate it. It's Barbara, not Barbara. Right, Barbara. Barbara. Barbara, yep. Glad to meet you. Hello. Hello, Alex Robbie. Happy to have you on. Okay, everybody. Gonna tune out now. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Tune in again on Monday. Uh, check out the Discord for some fun discussions and also updates. I will tell you if I can't make a reading or if I'm going to be changing anything or if anything. That's where I'm going to make announcements, of course, on here too. But uh, uh, on the days I will post around 3 or 2 o'clock if I can't make it. Uh, check out the Patreon. We're doing other readings there too, live on Mondays and Tuesdays usually uh, of other books. So if you'd like to, it's all in the description of the video. Uh, thank you for tuning in. This has uh, been a lovely part of my day. I'm I'm always happy to connect with all of you and read the wonderful questions. I, I should be asked more questions because I get to know you all more. So thank you so much. Uh, see you all on Monday at 6 p.m. PST time. You are loved. You have value. You have meaning. Do not forget that. I will see you soon. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for this time.